I know it's 9.40, it's not the first session, so I hope everybody, everybody's awake. You slept and got your nap in during the 8.30 <laughs> and everybody's gonna be attentive. So my name is Mark Voorhees, I'm a senior manager in our voice security uh, product management group. And I, I like to start by quoting Mark Twain, right? So the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. You've already heard that quote. Um, someone somehow he had had an obituary printed about him, but I think um, that could be applied to the voice channel, right? So for now, you know, years, decades, everyone's saying, well, you know, email is gonna be the death of the voice channel, or SMS is gonna be the death of the voice channel, and you know, all these things have you know, gone on and on and on. Everyone has said, you know, voice is gonna die, we're not gonna have to worry about voice, we're not gonna have to worry about voice. And yet, here we are, decades later, and we still continue to see that high value transactions, important transactions, people still rely on the voice channel, right? Whether you're transferring money, um, you know, working with your bank, working with your healthcare, you know, your insurance agency, there's still some things that you just need to talk to that live body on the other end of the phone. And so that's why we need to, you know, really start to talk about, you know, how has voice changed in that time that we thought it was gonna go away? Um, and what are some of the ways that that's caused problems for enterprises, government agencies? So, push the right button, Voorhees. Um, you know, standard disclaimer. Um, so. Do you remember when you used to enjoy answering the phone, right? If you're old enough like me, right, turning 50 this year, you remember like the phone would ring, you'd be like, what is that? You know? It's probably some exciting news. Maybe I won Publishers Clearinghouse this month. I don't know, but I'm gonna answer it, right? It was like this implicit contract. You know, if the phone rang, you were supposed to pick it up. Um, within businesses, you know, what was the marketer's job was to help sales by making the phone ring, right? That was what we all wanted. Um, but as you know, things have grown and as uh, voice has moved towards voice over IP, what we've seen is that the ability to manipulate it, the ability to attack it, has really taken off from a lot of the traditional cybersecurity attacks um, and just leverage those against the voice channel. And so what we see, you know, or what we tend to see is sort of these two main concepts of spoofing and robocalling, really, so attacking origin, right, just like we would with an IP spoof, right, we can make it look like the call is coming from a different phone number, right, we've all seen these on our phones, you get a call and it looks like it's coming from the same area code and exchange as yours, so it looks like it's a local call, it doesn't look quite as strange or quite as unusual, it's probably someone in town, probably a neighbor, and it's not. <laughs> There's even some that are doppelganger attacks where it looks like it's your own phone number calling you out of sheer morbid curiosity, you pick that thing up, right? So. Those are all different types of spoofing attacks. Now, the problem or the reason these exist, like anything, is there's legitimate applications. If I've called into a contact center and they're calling me back to help me work on the issue, I probably can't call in and get directly to that agent. So that agent's number can't be presented. So that contact center will outpulse their toll-free number so that I can call back into the queue and get in touch with that agent. It's a legitimate use. Robocalling, you know, or volume type issues, you know, again, legitimate uses, right? We've all gotten calls from maybe our kid's school, right? Snow closures, you know, other sort of public service, reminders about your upcoming doctor's appointments. Um, these are all legitimate uses of robocalling, but like any other legitimate use, it gets abused. And so then we have volume type attacks. Then we layer on top of that, of course, everything that the bad actors traditionally use, right? So once they're able to get you to pick up the phone, then we've got pretexting using a little bit of information to try and get that next step, that next link in the chain, right? Social engineering, playing the don't you know who I am card when you call into the contact center, pretending you're the, the boss and hey, you should really reset my password for me. You should make that wire transfer. This is critical to the success of our business. Do you want your job? Add to that now deep fakes, right? Has anybody heard anything about artificial intelligence and deep fakes this week? Maybe just a little bit. <laughs> There's obviously a lot going on within this area, and so deep fakes make this all the more uh, you know, pressing, right? So we get these calls, and, and not only is it maybe a bad actor who's trying to pressure us, but it's a bad actor who legitimately sounds just like the boss, just like you know, somebody else. So who does this impact? Well, as I mentioned, if I looked at anybody's cell phone in here, I could probably look at your recent calls list and probably find dozens, if not hundreds of calls that you swiped left on, said no thank you, don't know that number, don't know that number, not gonna answer it, right? 
um, and the ones that you did swipe right, you know, to use you know, that, that term, um, are probably ones where there was a name, you know, maybe someone who's already in your contacts, and so you know who it is, or maybe you were expecting that call. Maybe you got a text from someone who said, hey, can I give you a ring? You know, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that because I'm, I'm expecting it. I, or I've, um, the only other ones that are from numbers I don't know is when I have WebEx call me to attach to the call, right? <laughs> like that's, other than that. So consumers, you know, there's this lack of trust in voice calls, right? And the problem then is not just the volume of calls that we don't want, but it's the not answering the calls we do. How many times does a call go into voicemail and you realize later that your DoorDash driver was actually delivering your food and now it's getting cold on the doorstep? You're like, should have answered that one, right? You know, Uber driver, maybe you're refinancing and your banker's trying to get in touch with you because they need your documents. So there's legitimate calls where we don't know that person's number, but we wish we had answered it. For enterprises, this is kind of hyped up a notch, right? So we all know that we get a certain number of calls that we don't want. Enterprises now, they've got their phone numbers plastered all over their websites, on the back of credit cards, right? So they become a very high value target. You know, I'm not saying that your net worth isn't significant and that bad actors aren't going to attack you, but it's nothing compared to the large banks, right? The large healthcare companies, they're a much more attractive target. So these enterprises are getting all these targeted calls. They're also getting the, the random, you know, sort of uh, calling everybody within a certain area code exchange. Uh, but they're also getting you know, these very targeted calls into their contact centers, you know, targeted fraud, uh, targeted social engineering. And they also have to worry about things like telephony denial of service, right? Telephony denial of service can take a lot of forms, you know, from traditional denial of service. It can just involve a slowdown. If I'm calling into a contact center, I don't need to throw in so much volume that their voice circuits actually come down, I just need to throw in enough that suddenly hold times in their IVR queue go up and suddenly people can't get through to an agent and they get frustrated, customer SAT scores go down, revenue gets lost, and it's a problem. For a carrier perspective, you know, I'm from Verizon, we're very interested and keen to solve this problem because it's our business, right? We need people to trust the voice channel. We want to have that kind of trust, we need to restore that reputation. Um, we're happy to have you know, people buying SMS and chat and things like that from us, but at our core, we're, we're serving these, these needs of voice, right? We get paid when you answer the call, not when you don't answer the call. Um, so we have a, a definite interest in doing that. So what I wanna talk about today is a little bit of what's already being done, um, but then also talk about some of the tools that are out there for voice security to kind of hopefully provide you a little bit of a primer, a little bit of a lexicon on, on what some of these tools are like and what the different things are that can be done about it. So what's already being done? So I mentioned carriers, you know, us as Verizon and our peers have always done some amount of anti-fraud, right? So we're, we're looking at what's coming into our network, looking for invalid numbers. Hey, somebody call comes in and it looks like it's coming from a 911 with, you know, something else after a 911 area code. Well, that's invalid, right? Something's coming in with only a six digit number. Something's, you know, any of this is gonna be outright fraud, right? It's just obvious, we drop it. There's other things that we can do to keep that basic level of hygiene, but there's a lot more that can be done. And so the TCPA is probably one of the first major governmental or regulatory steps that some of us remember. Remember the old do not call registry? This is what, you know, 25 years or so ago? Had some modest impact or success. Maybe it made your home phone stop ringing a little bit. Cell phones still became a problem after a while and, and increased. And the last time anybody has probably gone to add anything to a do not call registry list is probably 15 years ago because you realize it just wasn't really meeting the bell in terms of filtering out everything that you wanted filtered out. And why? Well, we all know why. Because who obeys the do not call registry? Legitimate people obey the do not call registry. The people who are trying to defraud you, they don't care. <laughs> if they're trying to defraud you for millions of dollars, the odds of them being worried about a minor infraction against TCPA is probably the least of their worries. Stir Shaken then is um, another initiative by the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. Um, I'll let you look up what that stands for, but this is part of the Trace Act. The Trace Act was from you know, the, the government and the FCC a couple years ago to tell IP originators, you know, telecoms like Verizon and our peers, that we have to digitally sign 
any IP call that we're putting into the world, into, onto, the, onto the network. So this provides a good deal of attestation or non-repudiation. Hey, can we go back, can we trace where this call came from? And we can. Now, there's some limitations to that, right? Number one, it requires 100% end-to-end IP, right? End-to-end -end IP, and we're probably still a generation from this, right? So us working with all of our carrier peers to get all those IP interconnects up between us is still not quite 100% there. It's, it's good, it's better than it was, you know, two, five, 10 years ago. Um, but anytime a call is gonna traverse the traditional PSTN, a TDM switch, any of those digital signatures that are on that call, it's gonna get dropped. The other limitation, of course, is that there was a fundamental misunderstanding by a lot of people of what stir shaken was, what this digital signature was doing. And so the best analogy I can think of is the padlock. We all remember the padlock, SSL certificates, Saw that padlock in a minute was safe, right? Well, ish. <laughs> the padlock meant that your connection to that website was encrypted. It didn't mean that you should trust that website with your information, right? Just because it was encrypted in transit to them doesn't mean you wanted them to have that credit card number and that, that, um, that expiration date. So the same thing is true then with this you know, check mark that you might have seen on some calls that say this call is verified. What does that actually mean? Well, it means that the person calling you had a relationship with the telco that originated the call, and that telco signed the call and says, I know who this is. It doesn't mean you actually want to talk to that person. <laughs> now, sometimes that's because you don't like to talk collections, neither do I. Um, but that's you know, obviously a legitimate business purpose. That's not spam, that's not fraud, that's just unwanted. But it could also mean that you know, people are buying burner phones. Well, that burner phone is a legitimate IP connection to the network in, in a sense, but in another sense, that person's gonna make as many calls as they can, throw it in the can and get another one, right? So a legitimate call that is verified doesn't mean we wanna talk to that person. So those are just some regulatory solutions what about analytics? So most of the service providers out there have established relationships with analytics companies who can look at calls that are coming in and say, does this look like it's likely to be fraud? Does it look like it's spoofed? Does it look like they've done something to manipulate the header? Does it look like um, or match sort of a known list of bad actors, right? So we've seen a lot of volume or had a lot of reports of spam from this number, that number, the other number, then we can mark that with some sort of advice of risk, or AOR. You get a call and you see something pop up on the screen that says spam likely, potential spam, you know, any sort of variation of those words, that's probably coming from the analytics company providing that information to the call display. It's great, it's helpful. Like, <laughs> I wasn't gonna answer it anyway, but okay, now I know not to. Um, so that's a you know, good step, but what are the limitations? Well, just like anything else, there's a subjectivity, right? There's a subjectivity. So that call that's coming in, um, maybe it is fraud, maybe it is bad, maybe that algorithm has correctly identified it, um, but because there is some degree of crowdsourced uh, feedback that comes from this, every time a call goes unanswered or something gets marked on that phone as potential spam by a consumer who didn't want to answer it, then that analytics company is gonna take that feedback from the market and adjust the score for that number when it makes future calls. So if you've got a number that's going out and doing collections, just as an example, just to pick on <laughs> collections, stop calling me, uh, that number might get more and more people who say, I don't wanna talk to them, that's spam, that's spam, that's spam. That's not really spam, but all of a sudden that number gets this sort of black X you know, uh, associated with it. So when it comes across, it gets marked as such. So we'll talk a little bit of th about that in tools in terms of maintaining that reputation monitoring to improve that. Of course, the other aspect of analytics that is going to be problematic or difficult is just the, the nature of it, right? Like antivirus, like any other sort of signature-based detection, it's going to lag behind, right? So it's always gonna have to catch up to how are the bad actors now adjusting to the ways that these analytics companies are looking at traffic, scoring traffic, because one of the things we know about a bad actors is as soon as something stops working, they adjust. And so then we're going to have to adjust behind them 
and figure out what the new trick is to tweak that algorithm to get that to work differently. So what tools are out there? So as I go through these tools, I'm gonna kind of confine them to these two different swim lanes, if you will, inbound and outbound. And when I refer to these, I like to refer to them, I like to refer to inbound as voice security, kind of properly speaking, and outbound as voice assurance. Let me explain why. So inbound is what we think of when we think of security, right? Bad guys out there trying to get in here, right? It's the, the moat around the castle, the drawbridge, you know, what, whatever you want to call it, right? The, the alarm system. But, but everything that I want to protect is in here and they're out there attacking me. So sort of properly speaking, that's a more direct threat. And so when I talk about voice security, that's kind of what I mean is stuff that is directly coming to compromise some, something that I have had. Voice assurance though is um, a little bit more tricky because really what voice assurance says is I'm a legitimate enterprise. I'm trying to make calls to my customers and they're not getting answered. They're having the swipe left done on them. And they're doing that because of this larger cloud or environment of mistrust that exists because of all the spoofing, because of all the fraud, because of all the robocalling that's going on. So I have what I would call a virtual denial of service attack. It's not a legitimate, you know, not a real denial of service attack, but it's a virtual denial of service attack. The telecom service that I've bought is not serving the end for which I bought it. If nobody answers the phone, it's not doing me a lot of good. I need to find some way to elevate my good calls and if possible, kind of reach outside of my normal zone of influence to affect the bad calls that are happening out in the, in the wilds, right, out in the wild. So that's the idea of, of voice assurance is how I can reach sort of beyond those walls. Okay, so let's talk about, first of all, those inbound voice security tools. At the simplest layer is gonna be an anti-validation type of tool. Anti-validation is, really a very simple kind of study of the header to determine is this call coming from who it says that it's coming from, right? Has something been done to manipulate that header so that although it says it's coming from this cell phone number, it's actually probably coming from some foreign country somewhere, but they've manipulated that. They've done something to, to adjust that. This is extremely useful for enterprises. Right, so it, it might not be something that makes sense. So we talked about legitimate spoofing, contact centers making outbound calls, wanting to outpost a toll-free number. So anti-validation might not help if you're getting calls. You know, as a consumer, anti-validation might not help identify, you know, might sort of misrepresent something as spoofed when it's a contact center calling you. You probably don't want that. But for an enterprise, it's very unlikely that legitimate consumers are somehow masking or spoofing their calls into these businesses. And so for a business to put anti-validation in front of their contact center, in front of their enterprise is extremely effective, sort of the old 80-20 rule, right? I can probably get rid of 80% of the bad with 20% of the effort. So an anti-validation tool kind of does that initial sweep. Now, the problem with this, just like we said, is it's not gonna get all of it, right? The bad guy with the burner phone his call's gonna come through as totally valid from an anti-validation perspective, but he's still got bad intentions. He's got my ill at heart, right? So we need some other tools that are gonna look at things a little bit differently. So at the next stage, we've got enterprise voice firewalls, enterprise voice intrusion detection. So this is that kind of mile wide, inch deep, but basic level of firewalling for your voice infrastructure. So putting something in place that just like a, a traditional firewall is gonna have policies, it's gonna have basic you know, blocking and tackling in terms of saying, I'm gonna detect and look at the trends coming into your voice infrastructure. Hey, I know that you usually get calls from these geographical areas. You tend to get this volume of calls and you tend to have this duration of calls, right? So origin, volume, duration, those sorts of things, then when I see something that deviates from those, red flag, right? I'm a small credit union in central PA. I probably don't get a lot of international calls. Suddenly I do, yeah, I'd like to know about that. I'd like to see that, red flag that. Um, see if there's something that I need to do about it. I don't normally get a lot of calls that are short duration. I tend to talk to my customers for about 10 minutes, but 
for some reason my IVR is seeing a really high volume of calls that are just staying in the IVR for 30 seconds. What do I have? Maybe I've got someone who's trying to do some sort of pin hacking, you know, or pin guessing. Right? I'd like to see some sort of flag about that. Right? So these sorts of things can work. This is also where a telephony denial of service type measure would fit. Firewall. I don't know if I did that or someone else did. Someone got tired of what I was talking about. <laughs> it's the bad guys that kind of get us. <laughs> so uh, this telephony denial of service countermeasure can be put here. Now, one of the interesting things about TDOS is really it's looking at the application layer in terms of you know, OSI model. Right? So traditional DDoS are probably going to operate down you know, level three. TDOS is looking at layer seven, right? looking at the application layer. That's why SIP becomes its own application and some of these tools are needed because legitimate SIP traffic isn't going to trigger DDoS countermeasures in the same way that a, that a TDOS would detect that. We saw this about two years ago with um, the company uh, wholesaler, uh, IP, uh, VoIP wholesaler that actually had a, a DDoS attack. So, so that's enterprise voice firewall and IDS. Uh, Want to move down to contact center tools. So. We've talked a lot already about contact centers and some of the ways that you know, they're operating a little bit differently in terms of both inbound and outbound calls, the way they're targeted in terms of toll-free numbers being on the back of the, the credit card. Look, the fact is the contact center is usually where the crown jewels live. Right? It, it's a very easy place for the bad actor to compromise. You know, I call in, I play that don't you know who I am game. I, do that social engineering. I try that pin hacking within the IVR, right? When we enable IVRs to do more, that's great in terms of agent productivity and containment rates, but it can also provide insight, information for the bad actors to gain just a little bit of information so when they finally get to talk to a live agent, they've got that pretexting information in hand. And so we need something a little bit deeper, right? We need something that's a, a, a little bit more content sensitive. And so contact center tools then are usually going beyond that anti-validation that is doing that basic fraud you know, or, or anti-spoofing tool and saying, let's listen to the actual audio of that call. Right? So yes, we're going to analyze the header, but we're going to listen to the audio. So we, we have partnerships where we actually fork the audio of a call to a partner who's analyzing that audio. And it's listening to voice, yes, but also the acoustic signature of the device the touch tones, the patterns. If you enter uh, you know, uh, your social security number, right, nine digit social security number in 500 milliseconds, that's probably not humanly possible. We probably have something automated that's doing that, right? So already we see where there's some sort of problem. You can detect unnatural randomness in entering pins, you know, anything like that. So voice, device, even uh, you know, pattern and behavioral tools can be used. These are compared to consortium data to look for known bad, right? So we see a known fraudster, and we can say, hey, that's so-and-so, right? You know, we, we always give our fraudsters fun names, right? Like I think like, I was just thinking about all the president's men the other day, again, showing my age, you know, deep throat, you know, we have silly names like that for our bad actors, right? So we say, hey, that looks like this guy, that guy. Um, so then we warn the contact center agent, hey, this looks like known fraud. That gives that contact center the uh, ability to do a couple things, right? If that call is still within the IVR, hasn't gone to an agent yet, I could drop it. I could send it to a fraud specialist. I could send it to the agent. I could say, hey, we need to do something additional to validate this, right? I could send it to a honeypot to see what that bad actor is trying to do so that I can use that information later on to try and detect more about what types of things are going to, you know, uh, a, a fraud activity is going to be coming into my contact center so I can train my agents to deal with it or to look for red flags from a, a human perspective. The authentication piece under contact center then is going to take that same information, right, that, that voice, that device information, that behavior, and it's going to use it in a positive way to enroll and authenticate users. Voice biometrics, yes, plus. Plus, right? So we've kind of long since gone past the idea of mere two factor authentication, right? We always say 2FA, now it's just MFA, right? It's just multi factor. So these voice biometric tools are saying, yeah, we're going to listen to the voice, we're going to authenticate using voice as one of 
five, 10 different factors that are all in the cocktail, if you will, of saying, do I think this is an authentic call? So I call into my bank and I've enrolled before and they know my voice, but I bought a new cell phone. I've always been an Android guy, but for some reason my daughter convinces me, hey dad, let's get with the times, let's get an iPhone. So I get a new iPhone. Bank says, yeah, that sounds like Mark, but that's not the phone that he called in on before, right? That gets thrown in the mix from an authentication perspective. So now I don't rely solely on the voice, I use these other things. Now that doesn't mean that I'm outright rejected, right? People are allowed to buy new phones. I am from Verizon, you're allowed to buy new phones. <laughs> But it becomes, like I said, you know, one more factor. So we, we tell that agent, hey, you know, we might need to do some additional work to, to validate this person. All of this, of course, is with the goal of getting away from KBAs, right? Those knowledge-based assessments. I keep talking about my age. I'm 50 years old. I don't have a favorite color. And if I did, I don't remember what I said my favorite color was three years ago when I enrolled here. It was spring then, and I'm more of a winter now. So. <laughs> So anyway, we, we see the need to get away from those kinds of, um, of tools because just like passwords get compromised, those KBA answers get compromised in the same way, right? So bad actors have those. We need something that is gonna do a higher level of authentication. So let's talk about some of the outbound tools. Again, I talked about the environment of mistrust. I talked about that idea that there's stuff out there that we need to do something about. So, I'm gonna start kind of from the bottom up this time, and I wanna talk about reputation monitoring, because we talked about scores and the crowdsourced nature of things. So the, the collection agency, people are marking that as spam, or just bad actors are using your number to call people. It's getting marked as spam. Suddenly when you're trying to make legitimate calls, your customers are saying, hey, I didn't get your call. You know, it went to voicemail, or it was marked as spam, so I didn't answer it. Well, that's a problem. Right, that's a problem. And sometimes it's just an annoyance and sometimes it affects business, right? Sometimes it affects life and death, right? There was a story a couple weeks ago of a family who didn't get a call from a hospital after a loved one had been in a car accident because the hospital tried to call them to notify them that they had their loved one in the emergency room and the call was marked as spam, so they didn't answer it. So we have to take care of this. I'm not trying to bring the room down, but we see this as a real problem and, and, and affecting people's lives in a real important way. So what reputation monitoring does is it allows us to look at those analytics companies and say, how are your calls being scored, right? How are your calls being scored? Are you being marked as spam? And if so, can we go back to those analytics companies and say, hey, wait a minute, I'm making legitimate calls here. I'm following TCPA, I'm following Stir Shaken. My calls are legitimate. Just because someone else is spoofing my number, don't mark my calls as spam. So we work with the analytics company. We figure out ways to get those scores adjusted. We figure out ways for them to adjust how they're addressing those scores, how they're looking at, okay, well, here's the calls that got marked as spam. Yeah, I see maybe this new attack vector was being used, or if I analyze the SIP header or tweak this algorithm, then we can make some improvements there. Right, so you don't get scored badly, but the others do. So reputation monitoring. So we start getting our legitimate calls answered. But then we say, wait a minute. That's good that my calls are getting answered, but someone is still doing that. Someone is still out there pretending that they're me. They're still spoofing my calls, and I want to stop that, right? I'm a bank. When someone defrauds my customer, that customer comes back to me and says, hey, someone drained my bank account. You need to put that money back. So we need some way to stop those spoof calls from getting through to those consumers. So anti-spoofing solutions allow the enterprise to register their legitimate calls with the terminating service providers to say, I'm about to call number X, I'm about to call number Y, right? Once we start registering the calls that we're making with that terminating service provider through some sort of out-of-band mechanism, like an API that tells them we're about to make that call, and we say, now that I have this relationship with you, now that I have this secure channel to tell you when my good calls are coming through, you know that anything that I don't tell you I'm making is coming from someone outside of the, the circle of trust. <laughs> Those calls that are coming outside the circle of trust should be blocked, should be dropped, or should at the very least be marked as spam or spoofing with some sort of advice of risk. Now I've reached outside of my own zone of control, outside of my 
my little castle, my fortress, and, and I've started to affect the way that my numbers are being abused out in the wild, right? So that's what this anti-spoofing solution is doing. The other solution that we have here is then call branding. So I say, okay, that's good. I'm stopping those bad calls. I like that. Now, how do I get consumers to start answering my calls again, right? They don't have my number in their contacts. It still comes through as just a 10-digit rando, right? So call branding allows me to put a name, a logo, a reason for call onto that call screen in front of that user. So they see, hey, this is Home Depot. I'm about to deliver your refrigerator that you ordered. Let me know when you'll be home so that my delivery guys can, can get in and, and install your new refrigerator. Hey, I'm your Uber driver. I can't find you. Where are you? What corner are you at? Right? We want to answer those calls. So, so seeing that come up on the screen allows us to answer those calls. There's two means of this um, call branding available today. The out of band is using uh, somewhat parochial means to work with individual analytics companies through each of the um, three major telco providers to work with them to say, hey, when I register this call, brand it, you know, here's, here's my logo, here's my name. There's some work on some in-band tools that are gonna kind of take what is in place with Stir Shaken and digital signatures and add additional SIP headers using rich call data. So name, logo, call reason, all that can be put in that call header, digitally signed, and then there's, you know, a, a, again, a sort of um, circle of trust amongst providers that we say, okay, I know if I get rich call data that was signed by this certificate, then it's subject to audit. It's subject to, to audit. So obviously anybody can put that header information in. Not everybody can sign it with that trusted certificate that we've all agreed to share from an ecosystem perspective. So that in-band rich call data is, is where things are going in terms of trying to create an industry standard as opposed to those more parochial out-of-band mechanisms. All right, so where should I start? You're leaving here. You've had a great week, especially now that you got here this morning. Hopefully you're awake now. You're awake enough to have learned a little bit. What are you going to do when you leave here? Well, I would suggest a couple things. First of all, we all have limited resources. We all have limited capital, and we all have limited time, right? We've talked about a lot of potential tools today, and you say, they're all great, I want to implement them all. But you can't, and I know you can't because I know that I can't, I know I don't have the money or time to do everything all at once. So go home, talk to your fraud team, right? Figure out what do our fraud losses look like? Where do they come from? Where are they sourced? Are they coming into our contact center? Are they coming into um, you know, our point of sale? Are they coming in through you know, the web? You know, let's figure out where those fraud losses are coming from, and if there are voice security measures that might address those, then let's talk about that. Talk to your contact center teams. Hey, what does agent utilization look like? What is the effect of bad robocalling, bad fraudulent calling on agent utilization, on IVR hold times, on customer satisfaction? Ask your contact center manager, hey, if, if we reduced agent call handle time, you know, the amount of time it takes them to authenticate a customer before they actually start working on an issue, right? If that agent, instead of taking 90 seconds to ask four KBAs, instead they had to ask maybe one KBA, um, how would that affect your agent utilization? We get away from that idea where security is just an insurance play and we start to say, is there real ROI for implementing some of these tools? Right? If I can measure agent utilization, if I can measure fraud, then I can look at those. So that takes us down in the next three months, right? Figure out which of these things is the biggest pain center, right? It might be fraud. It might be the bad stuff that's happening. It might be the bad stuff that's coming in. That might be number one, right? And so then, okay, that's where we want to start. It might be answer rates. You know, that contact center guy might say, you know, if we increased answer rates by 5%, revenue would go up by X. Right? So what can we do to increase answer rates? What can we do to reduce spoofing, improve reputation, defense, get branded calling implemented, get those answer rates up? And in the next six months, talk to a voice security specialist. You know, obviously, bias, contact Verizon, we're, we're happy to help. But talk to someone from a voice security perspective and say, look, I, I, I know now I'm armed, I know about all these tools. 
which of those are gonna solve this problem? Because right now this is where it hurts and I, I know enough to say I think I need this kind of tool. So that's everything. I welcome any questions that you have. Um, oh, thanks. So uh, you, you touched briefly, I think, on my question with anti-fraud and authentication, and you kind of talked about AI and deep fakes. So what do you think is the tools in the future to spot deep fakes when you have a customer calling in? Yeah. I mean, that's one thing. And then we've actually, so I'm from Canada with the credit unions. We've had a scenario recently where we've actually had fraudsters call into our service provider for a credit union and get them to change the routing on the 1-800 numbers so they could then all of a sudden become the call center for the credit union. Uh, like the old, the old fashioned, like swatting. Is yeah, the so but I just, right. what are you doing or what do you think would be, should be done and how should we spot deep fakes? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, so in addition to those authentication tools, right, I talked about the idea of you know, voice biometrics and, and voice coming in. And the first step is to know that it's not the only factor that's being used for authentication, right? Because if, if we relied solely on that, then the deep fakes would be an even larger part of the, the problem. Um, the partners that we're working with, um, we work with a company called Pindrop, they've developed a specific deep fake detection engine that is layered on top of that. Um, so just a little anecdote, Pindrop, um, a couple months ago when the New Hampshire primary was coming up, you might have heard in the news there was a deep fake that went out to a number of voters in New Hampshire telling them, ah, oh, there's really no voting this primary, you know, don't bother. And the voice was a deep fake of President Biden. And so you get this robocall, and we're used to political robocalls anyway, so it was a political robocall uh, allegedly from President Biden saying there's no, uh, no, no voting this Tuesday. So Pindrop got a hold of the audio did an analysis, said within two seconds, it's a deep fake. Not only said that it was a deep fake, but said the software that generated it was this particular company, right? So we could, uh, of all the people that are generating deep fakes, we can sort of see the way their deep fake or AI engine creates that fake. It's gonna leave a sort of acoustic fingerprint. So they said this was made by this software. They informed that company, that company said, yeah, that does look like us. As a matter of fact, we just found the guy that did it. So um, that's a long anecdote to your question, but you know, these, these companies that are doing this sort of voice biometric are also saying, we're gonna layer this deep fake detection on it. Obviously, like anything else that we've talked about, there's always going to be that zero day thing. We always have to try and keep that up to speed to stay ahead. Um, but that generative AI is, you know, there's a lot of collaboration because that was, that was not on the, the AI company, you know, that, the, the fact that their software was misused is not really on them. But by collaborating with, with Pindrop that did that analysis, they were able to find the person that did it. So when you hear from the FBI, they talk about the massive losses with business email compromise and a lot of it is this deep fakes and voice spoofing. If you have so many tools that you've got rolled out, why is there such massive fraud going on and losses that seem to be out of control? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of tools out there. Unfortunately, um, those tools have to be implemented. Those tools have to be put in place. Um, so just the fact that the tool exists doesn't mean that it's protecting every call that's made. Um, so in the same way, um, let me just give you sort of an example, right? So um, company X, uh, you know, let's say we know that there's a lot of fraud coming from a particular country, right? It seems to be sourced from, from this country. Well, why don't you just block calls from that country? Well, the problem is, is if I do that, then I've got this customer who says, well, we actually have legitimate calls from that company. We do business with that country. We have an embassy in that country. So just outright blocking that source of bad calls isn't really enough. It needs to be done from a granular perspective or a sort of managed perspective where we collaborate with the companies and say, how can we help you to implement these tools within your own voice infrastructure? So there's some things that we can build in and where we can build those things in and do that sort of protection, 100%. 
we, we can, need to, and are doing that. But there's some things that still require enterprises to say, because our needs are specific, then we need to buy specific purpose-built tools and tweak them, manage them, and customize them for our own telecom needs. Other questions? Everybody's ready, armed, to go out there and fight the bad guys with <laughs> voice security? One more. Hi, um, my name is Zhao. Uh, I work for a hedge fund based on New York City. Uh, I have family members um, that are um, not as tech savvy, I would say. Uh, they <laughs> answer phone calls and I'm like, uh, they answer phone calls and they get pushed like verification codes. Um, there are some that are legit but those attackers, um, they actually contact the bank, pose as you, yeah. and send that legit verification code. Um, any ways to attack that, uh, to like defend against that? Because I know obviously you could just hang up. Yeah. Um, what other ways? Yeah, so the, the, um, let me just sort of, sort of summarize. The, the, the bad at actors are kind of acting as a sort of man in the middle, right? Where they're kind of putting the bank on one end and purporting to be the customer to the bank, then purporting to be the bank to the customer and sort of intercepting one-time passwords, you know, um, even, you know, uh, what you, you, you somehow call, you tell the person that there's some fraudulent charges, you get enough information to make a fraudulent charge, <laughs> now all of a sudden you, you get access, right? You get some sort of man in the middle. Um, these are complex attacks, you know, pl plain and simple, right? And so um, let me try and take that in a couple different pieces. The first is, you know, what do we do about the less tech savvy family members? And the first thing I would say is, you know, there's, there's apps, there's, there's ways that we can put things on our devices, right? If you're familiar, so Verizon, just as an example, has a call filter app, right? If you have an Android, oftentimes it's installed by default. If you're iOS, you need to go to the iTunes store and download it specifically. But that call filter app is what's going to bring in that information from the analytics company that will give you the advice of risk. And so one thing you can do for your less tech savvy, you know, moms and dads, grandmas out there is say, hey, let's get some sort of basic app so you can detect these sorts of bad things coming in. So that's, you know, one step, one simple step. As far as um, the larger attack, we need to get some of these anti-fraud and authentication tools into those banking contact centers so they can detect that this is not the actual customer calling in. Um, so that's a, a way to attack it on that end. We're also looking at some other sort of broad um, integrated solutions where we can take um, SMS information, SIM swapping information, and kind of layer it into all these things so that we can hopefully kind of see the coordinated aspect of an attack going on. Um, we don't have all those sorts of shrink wrapped and commercially available in, in terms of solutions. But we're talking to those providers and, and looking at the own data that we have within Verizon to say, you know, how can we coordinate a countermeasure to that? So I, I wish I had a, a better <laughs> off-the-shelf answer than that, but I hope that helps. Uh, there's been a, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. There's been a recent increase in attacks where uh, somebody, for example, posing as, as a CEO is calling, let's say, a VP or a you know, down-the-line employee asking them to transfer mm -hmm. $100 million or approve something. That's, not, that's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer attack. It's not you know, into the call center. It's not you know, anything like that. Is there a good way out of the box to mitigate these kinds of things? Thanks. So usually you're probably using some sort of a deep fake technology so that they're um, posing as the CEO. So those sorts of peer-to-peer -peer attacks uh, you know, are going to be more difficult because it's not going to the contact center, and a lot of those authentication tools are specific to the contact center. A couple things that we can do... Um, what we're talking to right now with some of our partners, especially the ones that are doing some of these deep fake type calls, is, is that a technology that we can make available at all to consumers? Does it scale? Um, is it something that maybe we could offer it at least as some form of like an executive service, right? So someone who has some kind of purchase or financial authority within the company would have the ability to detect that that's coming in. Um, that's kind of a starting point right now. We, um, from a you know, business case and marketability, we kind of have to figure out how applying the deep fake detection at the millions of lines from a consumer perspective is going to scale out. 
Anything else? All right. Well, I'll be um, you know, around for a few minutes if you have any other questions. I appreciate everybody coming and um, have safe travels back.